Hi, this is Justin Spring, and I want to welcome you to um, Psychic Unconscious Roots of Poetry. This is the last chapter. I think that this is going to be the 20th chapter. It's a kind of summing up, and in a way, I guess if you uh, have never seen of the, any of the other installments, it's also a pretty good introduction. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to say is that I have a, a very different view of poetry than most poets. I started out with the same view, that, view of most poets as poetry as literature, as a branch of literature, if you will, okay? And I have plenty of books out too, so I know what I'm talking about when I talk about poetry as literature, and I know its characteristics, and I won enough prizes in that area to know that I'm not scribbling nonsense. But some time ago, my life took a different turn, and I began to see poetry not as a literary event, which it can be, and it can be a great literary event, but to my mind, less and less of a great literary event as time goes on and as poetry becomes more conscious in its creation. It's one of the things that's happening with your poetry today for a variety of reasons uh, that I've written some essays on, but it, but... It's really not important to go into the reasons uh, because it is happening. We all know it. You know, poetry has uh, lost much of its magic to to uh, the public. There are very few readers of poetry. There is very little really good poetry going on that really surprises you and that takes you to another place. You know, it's kind of come down to a kind of MFA formula, you know, as a kind of academic way of life. And, and, and uh, what happens is you get a kind of uniformity of expression and, and your postures in the written poetry that, that you leave me cold, to be frank about it. What's happening in life outside of the academies is, is what's important. And although I had hoped that rap would have reached a higher stage than it has today, where it's mostly concerned with its gangster image and because there's so much uh, goddamn money in it, you know, it just distorts everything. But I don't have any doubt. I can see little threads coming through here and there where rap is beginning to take its rightful stage in the African-American pantheon of musical arts. But it also happens to be one that bridges into the spoken arts to a kind of poetry that was done before we learned how to read and write. Unfortunately, yeah, most of the rappers, you write their stuff first and memorize it and then deliver it, so, so it doesn't quite have the characteristics of an oral poetry, but it, it's a halfway bridge. And there are some who have learned to freestyle it in a way uh, that's helpful, but I think until the insistence on rhyming is dropped, uh, that it's never going to become a true spontaneous oral poetry with the power that poetry can have. What I wanted to, but that is an aside, because that's what's happening in the streets, which is where everything new happens. It doesn't happen in the academies. They're always looking backwards, you know. What you really want to see is what's happening in the streets, in dance or in art or in photography or, or in theater. Whatever is taking place in the streets is really what's happening. And so you should keep your ear to the ground as to what's going on there, especially in the African-American community where... Anything in music or dance, if you don't pay attention to it when it hits the streets, you're asleep. That's what's happening, and in fact, will eventually work its way into our culture, into what I'd call the white culture, and, and in fact, enlivens that culture as well, you know, in a slightly modified form. Uh, but there are some, there are you know, some artists who seem to you know, transcend the, the, the bridge that seems to exist between those cultures, somebody like a Ray Charles, for example, okay, who just seems to be able to bridge you know, you know, both worlds, and there are you know, many others as well, you know, that bring that richness and that spontaneity and uh, the, the, the soul of the African-American community into the white community, and some other white guys get it, you know. <laughs> they wake up. I'm always awake to it. You know, I don't do that kind of poetry, but in, if you, you pare it down to its essence, there's not much difference. It's just in terms of, of um, the mode of expression, but at its central core, it's essentially the same. 
what I wanted to do in this series is to have you take a look at poetry, not as a literary event, something that's labored over and the words moved around and different postures taken and, and uh, the narratives turned around and jumbled and everything to, uh, for a whole variety of reasons that's, that's been going on in, in the thing I'd call imagistic poetry. Uh, I'd like to, to you step back from that for, for, for a uh, second and have you see poetry as a natural human event. And in fact, I know it's a natural human event because I have uh, uh, taught thousands of children of all ages and all persuasions, and by that I mean the mentally impaired and right kids in very deep trouble, ADD, whatever it happens to be, and the same with adults coming back from very deep mental illness, as well as ordinary citizens and kids, how to create a spontaneous oral poetry that can hold its own with any of the poems in the quarterlies. It may not be as fancy, have a lot of... Uh, uh, kind of academic themes, but it hits the heart, <clears throat> which is the important thing. Because what I've been able to teach them, and as to what I became absorbed in about 10 or 12 years ago, is a spontaneous poetry that occurred as soon as you opened yourself to the muse, and you allowed the muse to come up through you and speak. That sounds like a big order, but in fact, that's what happens in poetry, that you know, poetry, whether it's written or, or whether it's an oral poetry in the purest sense, the kind that would have been done by Homer and all of uh, the poets that surrounded Homer, both epic and lyric, if you will, you know, in terms of shorter songs. You know, people sometimes think that the only poetry that existed in preliterate times was uh, the epic poetry, but that's, that's, of course, nonsense. Where there are big fish, there are little fish. We know that from Shakespeare. And he was a little fish at times, and he was a big fish at times. I'm sure that Homer had some things he could whip off. As he says, I'm skilled in song ways of every kind. So we know that he's not just an epic dude. You know, he can come down in different ways. What b became obvious to me as soon as I started to do what I call soul speak, which is a contemporary version of the earliest poetry done by man, a tribal poetry that was done in antiphonal fashion, speaker and responder to music, it's communal. It's done from a level that is not conscious. You're on the borderline of consciousness, but, but you open yourself to the muse and you allow yourself to speak what comes to you, which is always a story. Stories are critical to oral poetry. That's the way the unconscious works, and that's the way the conscious mind works when it wants to express its feelings. None of the fancy dictions and none of the fancy schemata and postures and things like that that today's poets bring to poetry once once the poem enters into the world of consciousness they start to dress it up you know in little doll outfits and they send it out and sometimes it's quite beautiful most of the time it's a waste of time but what we'd rather hear is the cry from the heart that's the thing that really grabs us in poetry and that's where it's at, at home where it's best and that's the kind of poetry that that in fact I was able to not to teach but to uh, but to show children from the age of eight up and I might say all persuasions, I'm talking all persuasions, that if they just followed a set of simple rules to turn off the conscious mind, that the poem would come up and they would speak it with no effort. It would come out as simple as their gossipy stories or their jokes, if they're joke makers, you know, or if they're gossip makers, not repeaters, but guys who make up the original thing. The, those jokes and the gossip come from our conscious mind, pretty much, whereas your poetry is slightly different in, in that it's always initiated by the unconscious. And if I wanted to give you a definition of poetry that would hold for both all types of poetry since the beginning of time, antiphonal, single voice, written, oral, doesn't make any difference, it's that it's a rhythmic, metaphoric story that ends in a ecstatic moment of beauty and truth makes the hair go up in the back of your head. Your whole body fills with light. That's what poetic creation is all about. And anybody who has made a poem, created a poem, be they eight years old or whether they're 80, if a poem comes to them, the first time a poem comes to someone, it's almost like their first orgasm. It, it thrills them. They can't, they can't wait to tell you about it and if they've written it down, to show it to you. Because the body and... The, the whole body intelligence of human beings recognizes this is something unique. This is not a joke. 
story. It's not a gossip story. It's something else. And when you tell people, well, that's poetry, because the, the poems can come to you if you don't even know anything about poetry, which I've shown hundreds of times with kids who, kids who know nothing about poetry. Uh, when the poem comes to you, that's how you, you feel. You, you feel a story rising inside you, which you write or you speak out. It comes of its own accord, and when it concludes, when it closes, what I call closes, there's a moment of ecstatic uh, beauty and ecstatic truth. It is an orgasm. And I've come to believe that, that what poetry is at heart is the way that the unconscious and the conscious come together in a very special moment that makes us whole, totally human. It takes our surfacy, very clever, conscious, logical mind, and mates it again with our feeling passion itself, our deep unconscious, the part of us we cannot control. It's in the driver's seat, which is why it's not very popular today, and it scares people. I can't tell you today, when I work with a whole number of people, how scared people are of their emotions. Not people in trouble, necessarily, mental or emotional trouble or kids, they've had to deal with an, with an unconscious which is sometimes completely out of control, um, which seizes control of their lives in moments of anger or depression, whatever, so the, they've lived with it. It's the people who have never lived with it, who have kept it bottled down and who have the strangest facial twicks and everything else. And God knows, it's just amazing uh, what people go through and they wonder why they're, they're, they're highly neurotic or they can't sleep well or, or they can't have decent relations with people is that they're afraid of their emotions and if they're afraid of their own emotions, God knows what they think of other people's emotions, you know. Ooh. Those two have to come together to be human. That's the role of poetry. And it's the way that the, our, the conscious lives are lit up, if you will, with beauty and truth. It's also the way that we return the message from the soul or the unconscious or God, whatever you want to call it, the muse, I don't really care. It's just the part you can't control. When we speak it out, either in writing or in speaking it out, and, and it takes form in the world of space and time, that's what the unconscious wants to feel. It doesn't care about the goddamn words. Those are the spear carriers in the opera. What it wants is the feeling of time and space, the song of the unconscious clothed in time and space. It wants that back hungry for it. The, the unconscious lives in a world where space and time don't exist as they do in our world. It's only in the human conscious world that we have that. Because it's a natural outcome of a way of describing the world. It's part of our humanness. Time and space are to be human and to tell stories as human. And they're all interlinked in a way that um, I can describe in some some extent to you, but I think I've done that in some previous entries into uh, this the 20 installment on the psychic unconscious roots of, po roots of poetry. The most important thing is uh, to understand that to be human is to be a story creator, to be a witness, to observe the world and report it. And that reporting, as Homer tells us, uh, is to, he says, I sing to men and to gods. And it's the poet's role, it's not his job, it's his role basically, if he wants to fulfill his role in the most rich way, is to s sing that song to others and to the gods at the same time. And the gods in this case is our unconscious mind, the soul, the feeling self, the part of us that seems to go beyond our temporal bounds. We can never explain why things can come to us from the unconscious that we consciously have no way of knowing. After all, it's living with us, isn't it? Why does it, how can it know more than we know? Well, it just seems to know more. That's why uh, the world of prophecy, which is another aspect of the soul, has been so valuable to people in the past and to people who aren't fools today. Uh, they also see it as a way of designing their life in some way. There's, that, there's no sure bet with reason and with all of the introspective things we do in our modern minds to project ourselves into the future, seven different, seven different courses of action, and we evaluate them all, and we talk to ourselves about it, and then we choose one. And, uh, that will sometimes work, and it sometimes won't, you know. 
because maybe we didn't think of something, you know. In the same way that when we are subject to a voice, either from some other person who may be more sensitive to these kind of things, that's the real word for people with psychic ability, intuitives or sensitives, which is an older 19th century word, which I think is much, much better, uh, that, that they can say that this will happen to you. Often the time and the space is a little screwed up. That's the one thing that the psychic world just doesn't have a grab on it, what it's hungry for. So it's, it's like a dog who wants water, you know, and it wants the water of space and time. It wants to come close to us. It doesn't want to let us get away, you know. There's a, there's a phrase in the your witnesses log that the your listeners, who we can think of as God or, or a nameless God, the, the completely unknowable, and the witnesses who are us are bound to each other by promises, but nobody knows what the promises are. And that's the fact of the matter. But, the, but in fact, the statement that we're bound to the unconscious, and like Jung says in one of his letters to Alice Hickey, um, the, the soul is a Bruderman, the brother of man. Of, by man, he means the conscious self. It's the brother. It's to be respected. It's to be admired. Maybe not trusted. Those of you who have had brothers know that sometimes they can get a little, a little wild, you know. Uh, and it's to be loved. Think of your brother. And think of how you would like your brother to treat you. And then you can think of how you'd like to treat your brother. It's a very good guide for how you should treat the unconscious. Respect, admiration, understanding, love, a little wary. Not because the soul is a bad guy, because in fact your brother's not a bad guy, but he has the, sometimes his aims aren't exactly yours. The soul has its own path. And by soul I simply mean our essential character, just like the Greeks meant it. I don't mean anything in religion and I can't tell you the times I've, I've had speaking to Board of Eds and I mention the word soul and they climb up the wall like somebody's chasing them with a hatchet. Oh, we, have to, we, can't, we can't be talking about that. You know, the soul existed long before any of the Western religions. You know, it's a way of talking about the essential character. And what the Greeks said, Heraclitus said, is that uh, uh, character is fate. Meaning character means who we are essentially, how we come into the world. Forget about what our parents taught us, you know. That, that comes later to kind of a creed upon it and what the school system teaches and what everybody else tries to drum on our head, you know. Dateline, you know. <laughs> Drumming it or eat your veggies, whatever it happens to be. But the, but the soul is our essential character. That's the, that's the most important thing. And that essential character will determine our fate. Someone who is outgoing and loving will move in a much different world and live a much different life than somebody who is suspicious and hateful, a coward. Everybody knows that. Just think of yourself meeting one of those two types of people and how you react to them. One you shrink away from and one you move towards. One is a bringer of light and the other is a bringer of darkness. You know? So, so, so the, the, the poems that come out of those Two different souls are going to be different. And the poems of everyone, if they allow themselves to be as eccentric as the soul is, will be completely different from each other. They'll have some characteristics. They'll be rhythmic. They'll be metaphoric. And if we allow ourselves, if we go out on the tightrope of the golden thread as the muse unwinds and makes our lips or our fingers move in writing and we don't interfere at all, just stay with it, we will enter that ecstatic union of beauty and truth with our unconscious self and we become more complete. I can't tell you the effect of doing poems on a very frequent basis has had upon me. You know, generally, I did the little tracking once when I was getting interested in the mother goddess uh, being another word for the muse. And it came from a tip from my former wife who said, you know, you have a kind of cycle. It's almost monthly. It's almost like a woman's, you know. And, and uh, my ups and downs, you know. And I went to all the poems I'd written over the many years, and they came out to be about one a month. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's what happens, you know. They come out once a month. But 
sometimes when you court the muse, as you can do in soul speak, there are ways, and most of the time, if you approach the muse as you should, or you should, you should approach poetry as something both, both sacred and innocent. Do it any other way. Come on, show me a poem. Do a poem for me. People say to me, you know, I'm slap them around. Wake up, you know. That's that, that's not the right approach, and it's, and in fact, it's not a not the right approach for the poet. Make me famous. I want to write something. I got to get something. You can't do it that way. It's a a courting, and the best courting is done when you treat your superior partner as something both innocent and sacred, and then you get the gift from the muse, and the muse comes, and you you just have to stick with the muse because the muse isn't Betty Crocker. The the, the muse can come barreling down the pike just like the mother goddess could because they share somewhat the same qualities. That's one of the things you have to remember about the Mother Goddess. You know, I'm at an age where I'm constantly in the companionship of older women, which is nice because they have all that silliness. It's not in their head anymore, and and they're wise. But sometimes they get kind of carried away by the by the, the goddess thing, which is a kind of thing they start to recognize intuitively that there's a goddess in them. You know, which I think is what something that your poets recognize. I don't know quite how to put a name on it. I didn't know how to do it. There's something, there's, there's something inside me, you know. But th- that muse always turns out to be very nice in terms of the mother goddess of the women, you know. Might have some strong feelings on this or that, but it's not as wild as the mother goddess was, who was the mother of death and the mother of birth, the, m- the mother of procreation and the mother of copulation, you know, all at the same time. Angelina Jolie, <laughs> you can take a pretty good example of that. When I saw her playing Olympias in uh, in, uh, in the Alexander the Great thing, she was just fabulous because um, she's on all levels. You know, she's not a great actress, but she's a great persona. And in that uh, role that she had been cast here, although the Alexander looked kind of wimpy, I, I don't know what the hell was on the director's mind, uh, but she played a the great Olympias, you, did, you, did, you didn't screw with Olympias, and in fact, you don't screw with the mother goddess, and you don't screw with the muse. You know, I don't know any good poet who, who, who has ever had something that, in fact, writers call the writer's cramp, because the muse doesn't have any cramps, you know, that are worth talking about anyway. She's going to keep coming at you as long as you're open to it, you know. It's when you try to make up poems yourself, you get the writer's cramp. That's what all the novelists get because they're making their creations from their conscious minds with very little unconscious intervention. That's not true of all novelists, but it's basically true about the construction of of um, novels and why there are no novelists who are really good poets because because they're control freaks. They haven't learned to give up control completely. They give up little bits of it, but not you know. There's a different order of guy. Anyway. <clears throat> One of the things that I wanted to to um, have you focus on is that the next time that you encounter a poem, and I hope you only encounter good poems, and I would suggest one way to one way to do that, I can guarantee, is to go to soulspeak.org, which I'm going to show you here in a second, which is our web page, and just go to books, and you'll see a whole variety of poems there. Take a look at them. I can guarantee you that they're all good. They're all gifts from the muse. Some might be great, some might be near great, some might be just good. But they are never, never things that are consciously created. I I don't work that way. I only create a poem when the poem comes to me, and I'm a, I've learned to be ready. Either I will speak it out in a computer, which I find the most convenient and the easiest way to, st- to stay on the golden thread, or if I have no choice, I will write it down. But the problem with writing is the conscious mind is always active. When you do a spoken poem from the, from the unconscious, it's being in a half-dream state, and you have to let the, the muse seize control of you, and you'll feel her entering with a burn. I call it a slow burn. It's not a hot burn, but you can feel the energy burn. It's rising up with a story. The story's coming off your lips. Sometimes you see it as pictures in your mind. Sometimes the words form on your lips. You don't know what's going on. Sometimes you might see the words as a melange that, that, that comes up. But it's the same way that things come up when you tell your ordinary stories. But this time the muse is feeding you. And you have to stick on that golden thread because you don't know where the muse is going. And sometimes it's to an area of very high emotion. 
You can't be afraid of it because the poem will close correctly, which is the real trick, and will bring that ecstatic moment of beauty and truth that will make you whole in a very organic way. <clears throat> You know, and the more you do, uh, for, for a while, in a period of, excuse me, I'll take a little drink here, for a period of years, where I was conducting Soul Speak programs in many grade schools and high schools and mental clinics, <clears throat> I might have done 10 poems a day. And most of them were successful. I could feel the muse rising. Something about the <clears throat> communal activity that's engaged in things. We always did poems with people. And if you want to know how that's done, you can hear some of the things I'm going to play for you at the end of the show, just to remind you that communal poetry, <coughs> that's a poetry with a speaker and a responder to music, is a natural form of poetry. We've forgotten it. Um, but it is a completely natural for, form, form of poetry. <coughs> These are two <coughs> web pages. You might want to go to on how to create these poems. One is a knoll that's more or less written on it. It goes into great detail. The other is a video tutorial, which is very easy to take, you know. But also, if you want to get a book, let me just page down here to a book. <clears throat> this is a book I published some years ago, uh, probably 10 or 12 years ago. It's Soul Speak, The Outward journey of, journey of the Soul. It will give you a history of oral poetry so you understand what it really is. It's not the spoken poetry we normally see or performance poetry. And its relationship to written poetry and how to introduce yourself to it. Oral poetry is not a parlor game. That if you approach any of these things as a parlor game, then you're approaching the muse as a trick. The muse doesn't like that. You have to approach it as something both sacred and innocent. And what will happen then as you approach that in the book and as you read the book, it's given in those tones, you'll begin to understand what's involved in making the oral poem. You simply have to surrender, follow a couple of rules. You're really going to bring your mindset back to what was the mindset of preliterate peoples is really what I you set out to do for you <clears throat> without telling you that. And uh, to kind of keep you in that, that mind frame and then which, is, which essentially turns off your investigating, examining, critical conscious mind and just lets the muse pour through you and you'll wind up with a poem. And you can do it with other people, which is the easiest way to do it. It's hard to believe that, but something about the energy of the other person makes your poem better. And if you have a musician friend, it makes it better. It just happens that way. Uh, and probably the hardest way to make a poem is writing a poem in a room with nobody there. Writing itself is a private act, but speaking is always a public act. And in fact, you find yourself speaking both to men and gods. You'll be speaking probably to an imagined friend, or you'll be speaking for the people with you, or you'll be speaking to yourself. You know, we can do that as kind of modern people, but you'll also be speaking to someone larger. And that is that aspect of the muse that poets call the perfect listener always understands. Always understands. Just get it right and the listener will understand the perfect listener. The muse is the supplier of the energy, supplier of the story, believe it or not, and is also in some aspect takes the role of a listener or maybe invokes the listener. It's hard for me to say, but that perfect listener is the one that you're always talking to and who always understands you simply have to get it right. You can't fake it. You can't think for a moment how to do it. You just have to do it. D-O-I-T. Do it. No questioning, no thinking. There's no going back in oral poetry. Once you stop, you've lost it. And the muse doesn't really care for people who just don't have the balls to go out on the golden thread. You know, I'm not going to come back after a while. You have to do it. And you'll find a constant companion then in the muse. You know, it's the unconscious. Think about it. It's a road to consciousness that will feed the unconscious back in return with the song that's created with the energy and story supplied by the unconscious. It's a very close marriage. What that borderline looks like is very unruly. Nobody's ever going to tell you what it looks like between the two. Something like that picture in back of me here, which I like very much in terms of using fractals as an animated version of the Witnesses Log, the long myth that came to me because our 
our whole humanness is linked to poetry. And we're, we're becoming less and less human, we're becoming brighter and smarter, but we're not becoming wiser necessarily, see? That's the problem. It's the wisdom that comes with poetry. It's not a wisdom that goes up here either. It's a full body wisdom, you know? You think about it once in a while as to what happens to your body when you enter an ecstatic moment. It doesn't just occur in your head. Probably your head's the last one to explode into heaven blazing into the head, as Yates said. He didn't quite have it right, Yates. He was a little bit uptight. It's heaven blazing into the body. You know, your whole body lights up is what happens if you do it right, you know? So this whole episode of going back and of taking a look at psychic events that you may or may not be familiar with, voices and visions, and trying to relate them to events we've all heard about, and then suggesting to you uh, that the advent of a poem coming up in a human is a psychic event as well, because it shares all the characteristics. We just haven't thought of it that way. And also because many people are just make up clever limericks or who think of poetry as just little clever rhymes. They've lost the whole aspect of what poetry really is. It's become silly poetry. When I see the kids being taught Dr. Zeus and Shel Silverstein in the school system, I want to cry. It's, it's, it's okay, but these kids are open to real poetry. And I can show you hundreds and not thousands of recordings of kids doing poems in the soul speak method that open your whole body up. What do you get from the Shel Silverstein and the rest of those Dr. Zeus? It's just cleverness. Okay, I'll do a couple of them. They're fun. I like to do limericks once in a while too. I'll do one in front of you, but that's not. But that's not poetry. That's what the school system can handle. God help it. We we get a, a poem of sadness from a child. What are we going to do then? You know, what do the parents find out? We're teaching them sadness. If I can tell you, that's exactly how the school system reacts. I mean, we're just we're in a society that's horrible in terms of how it handles emotions. You know. And I should say also that, that it's been my experience and the experience of the therapist and psychiatrist who've been open to this method is that it's self-healing. Poetry doesn't need any afterward sessions, any absorbing sessions or any that, 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 that stuff because what comes up in a poem is what the unconscious wants to supply to the conscious mind and what the conscious mind will accept. It's a marriage. It doesn't care about all the messy details of abortion or abuse or anything that, 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 that are the shadows in people's minds. It really wants to, that the soul wants to talk about how it's doing now. You know, it wants to line itself up with our conscious life and it has to become a part of our conscious life and the way it does that is poetry. If you have any doubts about that, um, there are some recordings and there also are some written poems which you can read on our your web page, it's under therapeutic soul speak, you know, soul speak programs. You can see how things are handled by the unconscious, even when it gets down to child abuse, you know, when people who are now multiple personalities and trying to bring their lives together and so fragile they can barely talk to somebody and what the effect of soul speak poetry has been upon them. It's simply miraculous because it allows the 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 hurts that came out of those situations to be expressed and also the courage and love and the shame, all everything at once can be expressed in the way that only poetry can express it. No matter how dark the poem, no matter how it struggles, it always ends in a moment of beauty and truth, an ecstatic moment, something beyond reason, something that's healing and curative. If we had somebody in our school systems and in our therapy community who understood that, it's self-healing doesn't need any afterward sessions to explain what took place. What's taking place is beyond words. The healing is taking place, and I have many women who will back me up or multiple personalities who will say that their lives changed simply by doing soul speak with other women who were also beaten and abused by their parents. It was the one thing that, that, that in fact allowed them to change, that allowed them to, to break out of their protective shells and to start to live again in society. It's a big mouthful, isn't it? Well, it's, it's true. And I think what will happen also, if you look at poetry in a different way, as a way of bringing the two halves of you together in the way that they want to come together, that you'll have a more balanced life. You know, how your life is going to turn out is entirely in the hands of the gods. <laughs> 
You look at the life of Jesus and Alexander. Where their lives turned out weren't very nice at the end, were they? But they lived the lives that they had to live to be themselves. To be who Alexander did, he had to live the life that he did. And it almost had to end in the way that it ended. And the, the, the same thing for Jesus. But they were themselves. They weren't living the lives of their fathers or mothers or rabbis or teachers or Olympias or Philip, you know. They were living their lives. But they were meant to be on their time on earth. And that's why we reverberate to, to them as people. They weren't afraid, you know. They followed their instincts, which were coming from the deepest part of their soul, right to the bitter end. It was glorious and bitter for both of them. So, for different reasons, you know. Anyway, I hope that you take the chance to go back and to see the, the previous 20 chapters. They just lay the groundwork for all of this that I've just made this conclusion on. That to think of poetry as something more than just a kind of ivory tower literary adventure that nobody understands, you know, into a human event and not to turn it off on kids, let kids develop it and to show them real poetry and maybe you can go back and you can reinstigate it in yourself, you know, by getting exposed to good poetry. And you can listen to Radio Soul Speak too, just Google it or Google Soul Speak Spring or just go to our webpage, soulspeak.org, you'll see Radio Soul Speak, Video Soul Speak. There are, there are plenty of oral and video poems there that are, that, that that are created spontaneously with no forethought whatsoever. And they communicate very easily, too, because all oral poetry is like speech. It's like my speech, but it's a little more charged. And it has the interest of the muse behind it, and it's going to get you, you know, in the way that you're, you're waiting to be had. Put it that way. <laughs> so, you can, so you can get out of this humdrum nonsense and move up to that moment of a static light that really poetry brings you to. That's what it's all about, isn't it? To have those moments. What if you could live all of your life that way? It doesn't happen that way. That that's what it means to be human, to get a little taste of it. But we can go back to the trough if we want. We just have to be a little smarter than we've been led to believe we could be and think more about the heart and our instincts than about what we've been taught and what's reasonable. I never found a, a man who was reasonable to be very exciting. And I really doubt I would ever follow him except in some abstract task, you know, how to manage my income tax. I want somebody leading with a heart because the heart follows the threads that go through us and to lead into that, that are a part of the mystery of which we are a meaningful part of that mystery. That's all we get to know, but that's enough, isn't it? It's better than being flotsam or jetsam or just an accident, as they like to say. Anyway, I've enjoyed this series. I hope you do go back and look at parts of it. I'm going to sign off now and wish you well, and I hope you get to our webpage, soulspeak.org. It has links to links to links to links. It'll keep you moving until you find something that you can latch on to, and from there, you have to start to lean with what's growing in you. If you run away from it, you don't get many chances to come back, you know. Maybe one or two, maybe not even that. So when you start to move towards something, you get that first whiff, that, that first something pulling you towards something. It makes sense to go towards it. I'm going to play a little poem for you now, which is a very simple poem that I like very much. It's called the um, Hotel called Mexico. This is very quickly made. It was made like all the poems are. I got some rough pictures at first and when I looked at them I knew they were going to pull me somewhere. I always photograph without thinking what I'm photographing. I'll let the unconscious guide me, come back and look at them, load them on a computer, bring a musician in or bring some recorded music. I carry thousands of tracks with me, find one that fits, hit go on the computer and record the poem once. That's all it's recorded just once and then go back and fill in the rest of the visual stuff so it looks like a halfway decent video, but the essential frames are there, okay? Because they're the ones that acted as the catalyst to bring the poem into being and that asked the muse to come and to be a part of it. Here you go. 
Hope to see you sometime. Sometimes in my dreams. Sometimes in my dreams. I'm in a small Mexican town. It's so small. It's heaven. How small is it? I mean it's in heaven. It's heaven of yours. My father comes here every day. Every single day. To see me. Just me. He loves looking at my statues. Just me. It's a long, long way, he says. My. Between visits. Just me. Everything is just me. like shadows here. And then you come, he says, and I can see you and touch you. Like shadows. Just like the statues. The beautiful shadows. He likes the statues. The shadows in your eyes. He knows they're the part of me that will join him here soon. Those eyes. Not the boy who caused him problems, but those eyes. The man who grew up next to him and listened to him. I show him my name, which is his name. And Your name. He almost cries to see it. Your name. So solid after all these dreamy years of nothing. Your name. Memories floating back and forth. He can't think of anything better than to have me here. Your name. He knows I get lost in the shadows. Is my name. Of the statues and sometimes. I am. I forget who I am. I am. But not really. So forgetful at times. It's some other self comes up and. I can't even remember. My father likes that half. My own name. It's so different. Sometimes I wake up. And so real, he says, it's so real. And it's dark. To see you. So dark. In your statue. So scary. I can feel you. No light. I can feel you. No light at all. Not one even. Not one. Not one even. Anyway. Even. That's what happens in heaven. It's not even anymore, is it now? In a small hotel called Mexico where... Look. All of a sudden, we're together again. Don't you see it? I can't believe it. The window. It's you. I can't believe it. On the other side of the